All right, good evening, everybody. It is now 6.04, and we're going to go ahead and get started. I know that it's dinner time. We know that it's uh, it's really hard to kind of peel away from the kiddos at this time of the evening, so hopefully they've got full bellies. They're getting ready for tomorrow, um, and I'm going to do my very best to keep uh, keep it brief, keep it quick tonight um, to make sure that you can uh, make sure that you get to reading with your kiddos and get them to bed at a decent time. Um but with that said, I know how difficult it is to, to peel away an hour of your week um, and to spend it with us to hear a little bit more about BASIS in BASIS San Antonio Jack Lewis Jr. campus. Um, so we're really appreciative that you're here tonight. Um, so a couple of housekeeping items I just wanted to share. My name is David Hubalik. Um, my kind of day title is Vice President of Academic Operations. Um, I've been with BASIS for about 13 years, well, over 13 years now, um, since we only had two campuses back in the days when it was just our Tucson school and our Scottsdale school. Um, over the years, I was, I've been able to be in various roles. Um, and, uh, and so I'm really excited, of course happens to be the case that um, my dog is um, barking. So um, he'll stop in just a second. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, I've been with BASIS for a long time. I was a school leader for a number of years. I had the fortunate opportunity to be a, uh, a school leader at, at our medical center campus. And uh, with me today, I have my partner in crime. Um, and I should say, I'm really excited about the opportunity to be the founding head of school of our Jack Lewis Jr. campus. Um, I, I love working in the schools. It's my true passion. And if you read my intro letter, um, I've got three kiddos that are going to be joining the campus as well. So I'm really excited to be there with them too. Um, with them, I've got my partner in crime, Ken Tyrell. He's our head of operations. So he kind of manages the operational end while I kind of work with the teachers to, to provide an excellent um, academic program. I'm in the background tonight helping me out. We've also got Laura Durbin. She's our vice president of growth and Crystal Rodriguez, who's our senior marketing manager. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and jump ahead. Um, a little housekeeping. You all have been muted. I appreciate that. We're going to go ahead. And if you have questions at any point along the way, please go ahead and put them in the chats. Um, these virtual info sessions are a little bit more difficult to manage, um, given the number of folks and our inability to kind of see each other. So we'll, if you have any questions, please go ahead and drop them into the chat. We'll do our best to make sure we get to all of them. Um, and then if there's a couple that maybe a, a number of folks have been asking that are kind of the same, we'll go ahead and stop periodically and address those. Um, in addition to this, though, we're going to we continue to hold in-person info sessions. So please keep an eye out for those. We're definitely going to be um, having those. And I love having those. I love meeting the students. I love getting a chance to share um, my passion about basis and education with you all um, in hopes that you'll join us in the fall. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead into a little bit about who we are. Uh, you know, you, you've, you've, you've taken the time, you've signed up for the info session to hear a little bit about um, who we are. Um, first and foremost, who we are is, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate in the San Antonio area to have a number of really great educational options. Um, and we're among them, but we're a very specific option um, for families. Um, and, but at, at its, at its kind of purest form, who are we kind of, um, some of the things that we're proud of, we're top ranked, um, in terms of state and national rankings. Um, we are an academically accelerated program as always with, uh, charter schools, we're tuition free, we're open enrollment. We have no admissions criteria. Quite honestly, if you live in a district that we serve, your child can attend here. And that's one of the things that we're most proud of, especially considering the results of our kiddos. Um, we're high performing and not high performing just in the schools around us or just in the state or the nation, but we actually, we specifically establish ourselves in, in the way that we, we, the way that we really hold ourselves accountable as our promise to you as a family to international standards. And we talk a little bit about what that actually means. And, and I like to tell this little anecdote, um, you know, uh, where I'm from, Arizona, um, we've got these little things, uh, these little flags that schools will stick out of their, of their, of outside the front of their school. This is A rated in the state of Arizona, and certainly that's that certainly that's impressive. It's 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 an achievement for the students and the teachers. Um, but when you think about what that actually says, it actually means that um, you're you're one of the best schools. But in a state, when you're comparing it to the state, which is 48th in terms of academic performance among the 50 states, and in like a country that is. Um, about 13th in terms of um, overall, you know, OECD countries. Um, and so 
that's not good enough because we know when our kiddos are going into university, when they're matriculating to that next step, we know that they're not just competing with the next door neighbor for those top spots and those top scholarship dollars where they're not competing with the other kiddos in Texas. They're actually competing with um, the entire global marketplace. And so when we think about the standard that we hold ourselves to as a promise to you as a family and ultimately our kiddos, um, we have to make sure that we're raising that bar at globally competitive levels. Um, and so we truly are for everyone, um, for, for anyone, but not necessarily everyone, right? And so ultimately that's the beauty of school choice. Um, a little bit about the background of a basis. Um, you know, we've got schools across the country, but we started in Arizona. That was kind of right where we started. Um, but over the course of the years, because families, it doesn't matter where you come from, we, the most important things in our lives are our children. And we want the very best for our children. And so there's been a great demand over the years. And so with that demand has come explosive growth. Um, one of the things that you'll see on this graph, it's impressive um, in terms of student numbers over the years, you started to see that kind of growth trajectory slow a little bit. One of the things that we recognized that as we grew was that we wanted to make sure that we, we, we were committed and faithful in, in all of its nuance to the promises that we were making. So we slowed our growth down a little bit, made sure that we remembered who we were at a very fundamental level and what we were offering our families. Um, and now we're there again. And so Texas is really where we're focusing our growth. This year alone, we're opening three new campuses. And of course, you're here to check out our newest one on the Northwest side, um, Jack Lewis Jr. And so our elevator pitch, just as simple, straightforward as possibly could be. The mission of Basis Charter Schools is to empower our students to achieve a globally competitive levels with a transformative K-12 academic program. We learned pretty early on that our families want, there's a demand for our families, whether they're, they're five years old or whether they're 18 years old, ready to go off into the sunset. And we wanna be able to provide that entire scope of support and academic rigor across the board. And so that's our program. And that's one of the great things about Jack Lewis Junior Campus is it'll eventually become a full K-12 program. So that was our elevator pitch. One of the things that we like to do is we like to have a little bit of fun with our core values. And so, first of all, we think nerds are cool and not like, you know, nerds and, you know, like the screech powers of the world, those, um, those of you who uh, were Saved by the Bell fans as well. Um, but what we really mean by that is we want our students to value and to look up to academic achievement. That learning is, in, is inherently valuable and that learning for learning's sake is not only good for you, not only good for your community, but good for the good for the world. And so we want our students, we want to create an environment where learning is fun and learning is cool. We're learning um, where we grow academically and intellectually, not just in the books that we read and regurgitating the, mo the most amount of information, but truly embracing this liberal arts education that we provide because it's specifically designed to prepare that student for that next step, to make sure that every option is available to them, whether they wanna be an engineer or whether they wanna be a pipe fitter, it's available to them. But with that comes a necessary uh, criterion, which is school should be hard. You know, we think about, our, my, you know, my, my son, he's nine years old. He's really into football. He won our fantasy football league this, by the way, I was actually really impressed. It's first year playing and he knocked all of us adults out um, pretty handily. Um, but he really is into football and he will come home and he, he, you know, the last thing he wants to do is open that book. And the last thing he wants to do is, is get down and get to his studies. Um, but on Thursday nights, I can't get him away from that practice field. He'll be, he could barely breathe. He's running so hard, running the crossing routes, the out routes, whatever it is. Um, and we believe that that the value provided from working hard in the classroom far outpaces any in in most cases what students will achieve on the academic or on the athletic field now that's not to say we don't value athletics I'm a big sports fan we value athletics but we recognize that our job at basis is to make sure that our students are pushing themselves and pushing themselves in a meaningful way academically so we really think that school should be hard 
We believe that excellent student outcomes require expert, expert teachers. Now, this is something that everybody said, right? We're no different. Um, here. We're no different at basis in terms of our value of our teachers, although there's a cup, there's a there's a bit of a secret sauce that we provide. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But what we really mean by expert teachers is that we truly believe that students should be taught in core subjects by individuals that are knowledgeable and passionate about what they teach. Um, interdisciplinary studies is fine, but when we're talking about high-level physics, we want our teachers to know physics and breathe physics. So that way it's not just that they're sharing information, but they're bringing it to life and they're developing a passion in their students. So we truly take a model by which one of the first criterion we evaluate when we're hiring teachers is, do you know your content matter? And overwhelmingly, that is an indicator of student performance. We also recognize that student achievement is the responsibility and the reward of the entire network. And what we mean by that when we say that is that, um, we celebrate every success and we're down in the trenches with every failure. We recognize that every student matters and that we need to be there to lift up our struggling students and also celebrate and, and make sure that we're there um, to, to, to be there when our students cross that finish line. And it's not just the teacher, it's not just the principal, but it's at every level of our entire organization. We are an organization that feeds off of the, the, the successes of our students and only comes um, through hard work. And when we're not doing a good enough job, we work even harder. And then finally, and this is one of the most important pieces, is that our students are leaders and not spectators in their own education. Too often, um, and, and I recognize this as a parent, as a, as a father of five, it's hard to kind of let our kiddos go. It's kind of hard to let them kind of fall down on their own. Um, but they'll never learn how to run. They'll never learn how to walk. Our students will never learn how to be successful in this world unless we kind of let them go and let them take the lead. And the same is true in the classroom. And the way that we deliver on that, like I said, there's a little method to the madness, um, but the way that we deliver on that is, uh, is pretty specific and pretty nuanced. And sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, um, but we encourage families and embrace what we have to offer to just really um, fall in love with that because we are truly making uh, the leaders of the next generation. And we'll talk a little bit about what that culmination of our program looks like. And so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and stop because we're going to start moving pretty quickly. I'm going to go ahead and stop and, and ask Laura if we've got any question, any pressing questions out there. Thanks, David. I think we are working through them for the time being, so you can keep on rolling. All right, we'll keep on going. Very good. All right. So you're here to talk about Jack Lewis Jr. We'll talk a lot about um, basis in general and who we are and what we have to offer, but specifically Jack Lewis Jr. campus. Um, those of you on the northwest side of town, this is going to be, and I'm not just saying this because I'm, I'm trying to sell you on it and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the head of school um, of that campus, but it's going to be among the most, if not the most beautiful campus that we, that we have. It sits on just over 11 acres adjacent to the SeaWorld parking lot. Um, it's a beautiful part of town. It's sitting up on a hill that overlooks the, you know, the hill country, um, plenty of space. It's going to be a very, very beautiful place, not only for the kiddos to learn, but families and our community to kind of come together um, and just be a strong educational community. And there, quite honestly, is, is no better uh, way for us to kind of, to, to, for us to have gotten the namesake then then a true kind of steward of 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 san antonio over the years um jack lewis jr um was a was a member of uh the san antonio uh, community for a number of years um was a large educational advocate his son is a large educational advocate um and so we are we are making we're turning this school or we're naming the school um after him um because of his contributions um, it was it, that we. It was a large uh, anonymous donation to make sure that this happened in his honor, and so we're, we are we are then truly honored to make sure that uh, it carries his name as we move forward. Um, and so a little bit about him and, and his life and his family here. So um, we're really thankful for uh, the generous donation in his name, and we're honored to be able to to have his name uh, carry us forward on this campus. 
So a little bit about the building. It's going to be built in two phases. The first phase is obviously going to be opening this, this fall. Um, and the second phase is going to be opening up in um, 2025. Um, ultimately, when built out, we'll have about 1,200 students, grades K, uh, K to 12. And so um, this is essentially what the schematic looks like. Um, this is uh, both phase one and phase two. The top half of that building is actually going to be phase one. It's full, full with exercise rooms. It's full with um, large classrooms, making sure that every classroom has natural light. It's one of the things that we've actually, yeah. it's one of the things that we've actually realized. Hey, Joy. <laughs> it's one of the things that we've realized over the years is that um, as we, as we continue to build schools, we recognize um, there are things that we could have done better. And so we at JLJ are actually the beneficiaries of everything that we did wrong in the previous buildings. Um, and one of the nice things that I love about it is that every classroom has natural light. Some of our, some of our other campuses have kind of internal classrooms and we really undervalue um, at times what natural light does um, to, to, the, to the human psyche. And so um, lots of space, lots of play area, um, lots of opportunity for students to get outside. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then ultimately phase two will come, it will be uh, an additional 36,000 square feet completing that kind of courtyard area um, with, a, of course, a full gym, a full theater, um, additional multi-purpose rooms, plenty of space for the kiddos uh, both to be separated where uh, where necessary, depending on age, but also the opportunity for the come to get come together at times because we actually we think that there's a lot of value in that. We actually really enjoy um, the value that our older students and the maturity and then the intellectual curiosity that they bring to our youngest students. Um, and so with that, what I'll do is before we kind of dive into our, our academic uh, excellence uh, portion of this info session, I'll go ahead and stop. Laura, do we have any, any additional questions that we might want to address? Yes, there's a couple of them and you might be uh, covering pieces of this in the next section. So I'll kind of throw them out to you. And then if you wanna hold until you get to the slide that talks about it, that's obviously fine. So one is just some clarification around the sequencing for math particularly mm -hmm. where geometry falls. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the math program, because it's a little nuanced the way that we manage our geometry. Yep. Um, and another one has to do with uh, how do we track reading levels? It's a great question. So um, essentially, uh, we have a number of metrics that we utilize here in Texas to, to establish uh, our, our identify um, reading levels, and then if necessary, identify action plans to bring students up to speed if they're if they're struggling, or alternatively, um, provide enrichment opportunities for students to continue to push themselves. Um, historically, what we do internally at, at Basis in our primary programs is we use a program, it's a progress monitoring program called FastBridge. Um, it has national norms and also internal benchmarks. So because we always hold ourselves to a higher standard, we, we assess our students, it's only one assessment, but it, we, the results um, allow us to establish where are our students with respect to general college readiness, and then where are they at relative to the basis curriculum. Now, um, because of a certain initiatives um, in Texas, we've also implemented M-Class, which is a similar progress monitoring tool. It's a little bit more robust. Um, so this year, our students are kind of doing both, although we're doing both because we're kind of beta testing for the purposes of continued advance advancement. What's going to be the preferred option and what's going to ensure that our students have the best opportunity for academic achievement? So this year, they're kind of doing both, but historically, it's been uh, through the utilization of FastBridge. Any other questions, Laura? Perfect. And then you also likely talk about this in the next piece, but just a little bit more about how we approach reading instruction. Um, this particular question is about the, the grade one, um, but in general, probably in the primary. Okay. Yeah, we'll certainly get to some of those nuanced questions a little bit later in the in the in the conversation as we start to dive a little bit, a little more head first into the uh, into the um, into the curriculum. Perfect. Wonderful. All right. So with that being said, since there's a number of curriculum based questions, we'll go ahead and jump into academic achievements. So just uh, playing, you know, breaking it down into four core areas. Um, how are our students able to um, 
perform at the levels that they perform. Um, and it's not just through, uh, you know, uh, grinding our students to a, to a pulp. Really, it is about developing a level of learning and making sure that it's not just the environment, but the environment is supported by a curriculum that continually challenges students in a very meaningful and intentional way. You know, oftentimes what we find is that within, you know, let's say the state standards, for instance, and we'll use any state, not necessarily Texas, um, students will get a topic and then they'll never see it again. With our, with our program, we essentially begin at that AP level and we spiral down all the way. So by the time our students are up to that AP level in the high school, they are prepared, not just the select few have been tested into gifted and talented, but ultimately all students are able to be prepared and to be successful on that kind of the culminating exams um, at that point. But when we break it down, we really focus on four core areas. First of all, is their curriculum. Our curriculum is accelerated. Um, it's continually evolving, which is why we say it's state of the art. Um, and it's all in its AP infused, which I mentioned, college preparatory, of course, but it's college preparatory insofar as um, it's interdisciplinary. We, we really pride ourselves on a, on, on a truly interdisciplinary course, a liberal arts studies, um, to make sure that our students get both breadth and depth. Because it's, it's not by accident that Leonardo da Vinci was both an incredible inventor, but then also uh, an, an incredible artist, right? Those two things are not mutually exclusive. So we want to make sure that the various um, um, courses and, and content areas that exist out there, our students have the ability to not only um, to, to learn them uh, at, at great depth through individual courses, but also draw connections, which is really kind of at the heart of our primary program. Um, and so, and that's fed ultimately by our learning, by our expert teachers. Again, I talked a little bit about um, our focus on content experts. We want our teachers to really know their content and be passionate about it. Um, those of you on the other side of the screen, um, I'm sure you can kind of feel the passion about what I'm talking about when it comes to basis, because I truly believe it in, 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 in who I am and, and, and what I do. Um, I really believe in what it is that we have to offer students, not only from a professional perspective, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring my kids to basis if I didn't actually believe that it's a tremendous option for families. Um, but with that being said, we also recognize that at, at, at the earliest stages, our students are still learning how to develop. They're still developing. They're still kind of learning how to learn. And so ultimately, in our primary program, we have a co-teaching model. And not co-teaching in the traditional sense of a teacher and, a, and an assistant teacher, but truly two teachers. One that focuses on the content area, that's our subject expert teacher. And then the one that really focuses and stays with the students all day long, um, which really understands and has a strong a background in early childhood development, understands how students or brains are making connections at an early age. And that is our learning expert teacher. And together they teach in tandem to essentially enhance the learning experience for our students. And it also creates efficiencies within the classroom. So our third grade teacher is not preparing math, history, science, social studies, fine arts, every single day, which ultimately leads to burnout. It leads to a very difficult um, situation for teachers. And my hats go off to those teachers that do that every day, because I can only imagine the passion that they have to be able to pull that off. But over time, it, it becomes difficult. And so what we do is we have our subject experts, they prepare lessons for the subject that they're going to teach, and they're passionate and knowledgeable about. And then our learning expert teacher moves with their students all day to the various subjects. So the students have the beauty of, of a homeroom while kind of getting up, getting out, getting their wiggles out, and going to their subject expert teacher. And so it's a really solid model um, that allows for kind of the best of both worlds. We also recognize that, especially in a new school, but even when it's not a new school, we have kiddos that are going to struggle. This school is not just for the academically gifted, although we push students to that level. Um, it's, it's a common misconception that we're only a school for the talented and gifted. Um, while certainly we love those students, and we love those students that are able to, to kind of come in and access the curriculum in a very easy way, we are for students that want to work hard. And sometimes they just need that, that little extra uh, push, that little extra help. And so we have a strong student support program. The question was asked a little bit earlier about how we kind of manage our, our reading levels. Well, we monitor those at a, reading and math levels at a very early age. We have our in 
in third and fourth, fourth and fifth grade, we have internal assessments that make sure that we're capturing real-time information as to where our students are at. In the middle school, we have the same to make sure that every level, every grade level, we're keeping an eye on where students are at. And then we intervene with our Dean of Students and our student support team um, to make sure that we're filling in those gaps that may exist or may manifest as the curriculum becomes a little bit more difficult. And then ultimately, one of the key drivers are, is our school culture. The school culture is extremely important. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but it's really about our students not, they're being leaders and not spectators. And with that comes accountability. We believe in accountability. We believe in personal responsibility. We believe integrity and integrity. Um, we believe that uh, perseverance and being goal oriented is truly paramount not just in the, the realm of academics, but as they as they become, you know, they matriculate the college and move off into the world without these without these charisms, our students will not be successful in this world, regardless of how smart they are. So we want to make sure that we 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 ensure that we foster a culture that focuses on these that only that only um, enhances the learning experience. Um, and so again, kind of taking a step back, grades K four, we are focus on building foundations and making connections. This is where it's fun. This is where the kiddos, they really get to have a good time. They really get to, to learn a lot and really draw connections between the disciplines and really kind of see how they work together before we jump into our middle school program, which is grades five to seven. This is really where we start to segregate the courses a little bit more. Instead of taking science, we're taking biology, chemistry, and physics in independent courses taught by biology, chem biologists, chemists, and physicists. Um, to make sure that the students, now that they understand how the courses work together, they can get, they've got the breadth. Now we kind of jump into that depth piece. And so it's one of the great things that we, that, that we're able to provide at the middle school level. And so we're taking a deep dive into college or into the content to make sure that when our students get to that high school level and our students are taking advanced placement exams starting in that ninth grade, that they are ready and they're ready to maximize their college readiness. AP exams allow afford students the opportunity in most cases to receive college credit or a, a, it's, it, it's a little nuanced in the way that it works, but ultimately those are courses that are essentially absorbed by the college when if they pass the exams. And so we're truly able to maximize college readiness um, starting in that, that eighth and ninth grade to ensure that our students are, are prepared, not only just to get into the best schools, but to ensure that they're actually uh, ready to be successful there. And so as we jump ahead, again, it all starts in kindergarten. Our kiddos have fun. Kindergarten truly is actually our only self-contained classroom. It's a, it's an opportunity for our kiddos to kind of come together, learn together, have a little bit of fun, prepare for what's to come through their academic program. Um, in our grades one through three, we're still having fun, but this is where we implement our co-teaching model. This is where our learning expert and subject they teach subject expert teachers come in. Um, in the kindergarten, we still have two teachers in the classroom, but because it's self-contained, um, it works a little bit different, but it's still the two teachers. But then starting grades one through three, we have that co-teacher model where we have our learning expert teacher, which we spoke about, and our subject expert teacher, and really kind of facilitate instruction in, in a way that both creates efficiencies within the teacher's day so they can be better at their craft, but then also making sure that the students are up and getting active and getting around the school because they're moving around to the various subject specific schools. So one of the off, often one of the questions that we get is how much, how much recesses are our kids getting? How much time do they get out of their seat? At a basic school, it's quite a bit. They get at least two defined recesses in addition to, um, to a lunch, every lunch recess, every single day. And then on top of that, they're getting PE. And then on top of that, they're also getting up and out of their seats and moving from class to class with their learning expert teacher every class period. Um, and so there's plenty of opportunities for our kiddos to get their wiggles out. 
Once we jump into that, into that middle school program, again, these are our bridge years. We've brought and kind of stretched down that AP curriculum down into our middle school program. And it builds on the fundamentals that we were, that were laid in the, in the primary school. And, 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 but it moves at a much more accelerated pace to make sure that when our students are get to that high school program, that's really where they start to shine. Um, you know, we talk about middle school being kind of, you know, the, the, the polishing of the stone. It's not always this beautiful, you know, it's not a soft process. It's, it's tough. We, we work hard. Our students work hard to make sure that they're ready. And they take their lumps at times to make sure that when they get to that high school program, they're ready to shine. Overwhelming our kiddos say, you know what, when they get to high school, they say, you know what, our middle school program, that was, that was much harder than our high school. And then when the kids matriculate and they come back and they tell us their stories about being in college, they say, wow, base was, was actually hard. It made sure that college was a breeze. And so it's one of the nice things about our program is it makes sure that our students are able to shine when it's most important. Um, but again, going down into the high school program, our students are required to take a minimum number of AP exams. Um, and it's a minimum of six, um, but it's part of their normal program. They're ready for it. our curriculum is designed to bring them to a state of readiness to make sure that everybody has access. And because we pay for them, we pay for all AP exams. It's truly a mark of readiness academically. So there's no barriers to our students being able to get this, get access to this great program. Um, one of the questions I was asked is kind of, when do we teach geometry? One of the things that we, we pride ourselves on again is our proprietary curriculum. Our curriculum is, is, is built in house and has been since our inception. Um, but we have a proprietary math program that integrates um, geometric uh, principles into our Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 and pre-calculus course. So while we don't have a distinct uh, geometry course, our students, um, uh, they, they, um, they develop, they, they, they're taught, are the, the geometry teaks, they're taught um, the geometric principles necessary to earn that credit um, as they go on uh, and, and towards graduation. Our kiddos are done with their graduation requirements by the, the end of 11th grade, but that 12th, gr that 12th year that we call it our, our 12th grade year is kind of another bridge year to make sure that we're able to acclimate our students from what the high school classroom looks like to the college classroom. Because again, we're here because we're thinking long-term. Now you may have a four-year-old and you're thinking, does this work? Is this the right option for me? Um, I really want to focus on like what's happening in kindergarten, but when we think long term, we think about making sure that we're making that right long term decision for our kiddos, and it culminates in that senior year and that promise that we're not a school that just wants to ensure that your students have access to great schools and great scholarships, but that when they get there, they're successful. You know, um, there is a there is a statistic that I, that I like to use. In, um, and this, it's a couple of years old, it's, it's, from, it's about four years old, um, but um, the principle is kind of within it still remain true. You know, those of you who are familiar with the, the, seven, the top 7% 7 of individuals um, uh, in, 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 in high schools in the state of Texas get access to, to UT Austin. And um, so presumably the best kids in the state are getting into UT Austin, but the four-year graduation rate of, of, of UT Austin, of those kiddos, was only about 60%. And so when we think about it, even the best kids, the highest performing students throughout the state of Texas are not always prepared for what UT Austin has to offer. And that doesn't say anything about the kiddos or the schools. It just means that we have to do more for our kiddos to make sure that they are not only going to great schools, but they can truly be successful. So this is a breakdown of our curriculum. Um, we will be following up this conversation with, um, with uh, uh, um, uh, the slide deck so that way you'll have it. So you can take a picture if you'd like, but we'll be following up with it. Um, one of the questions, and I won't wanna go into too, too in depth, but um, uh, Laura Durbin did put my information into the slide chat. 
to the chat early on and she'll post it again at the end. So if you have more nuanced questions, please feel free, shoot me an email, give me a call, we can jump into it. But one of the questions is, what is kind of the emphasis on, on literacy? What's kind of the emphasis on reading? Um, reading is taught both through the humanities course um, which is every day for 85 minutes. But then we also have what we call read, which is every single day. That's more kind of guided reading practice with the teacher and the kiddos. And of course, that's going to change a little bit as we get as they get a little bit older, it's going to kind of be a little bit more advanced. But then ultimately within our literacy enrichment program, that's an additional three times a week where we're focused on literacy engagement and we utilize the logic of English program. It's a, it's a phonetic based program where we really focus on phonics and the development of reading through that, through that, that, that modality. And so ultimately our students are getting humanities every day for 85 minutes in our primary, in addition to literacy enrichment three times a week in addition to read every single time, every day. We know that, that when we think about some of the statistics that are shared by the OECD, that of course, um, your ability to calculate numeracy is extremely important. We pride ourselves on a wonderful science and math-based program. We've, we've graduated a lot of engineers over the years. Um, but we know that from a, a very fundamental economic level in terms of the economic reports that um, are shared by the OECD, that students are at a much greater disadvantage in terms of long-term economic um, success if they're lower in reading skills. And, and, and it's an area, especially as kind of STEM has become more and more popular, it's an area that it's, you know, there's always a cost. If you place an emphasis here, it's at a cost somewhere else. We want to make sure that our students, it's that, 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 that our robust science and math curriculum is not at the cost of literacy because we know that could have potential economic effects as our students move on um, and move about this world. And so we place a great emphasis on literacy um, and truly the humanities uh, in, in general, as you see here. Um, and we're really proud of that. When we, we don't just say that we're a liberal arts school, we actually put the proof it is in the pudding. And it's not just um, that our, our students are, um, uh, you know, again, we don't just say it, we mean it. Um, one of, one of the, the chief indicators when we, you know, and as you're, you're here, you've probably heard um, some of our rankings. We'll talk a little bit more about those, those later. And, the, you know, it's, a, it's an indicator of, of academic uh, performance of our students, which we're so proud of them. We, we love it. Um, but it's not just, you know, what are they scoring on, on any given exam? It's not just, you know, a singular data point. Um, but those rankings actually evaluate both depth, meaning the college preparedness, but also the breadth of the curriculum. And so in order for our schools to, to, to rank amongst the top schools in the country, it's not just that we can have a bunch of mathematicians or scientists. It's that those scientists and those mathematicians also have to perform at a very high level in the humanities as well. And so it, it truly is an opportunity for us while it is just a, a single data point and something that we're proud of for our students it's truly an indicator that we're making good on our promise of a liberal arts education so i talked a little bit about that senior year um, that senior year is that bridge course and what that is meant to do is really to take uh, to kind of take a step back from the traditional high school course that high school environment and give the students an opportunity of what they're going to be seeing in their senior year or in, in college to make sure that not just in content that they're ready for college, but in the environment that they're going to be, which is largely, as, as we all know, a lot more independent. It's a lot more Socratic at times. And so ultimately our students are going to take capstone courses, which are more narrow and focused, but much greater depth. And they're largely research-based. They're largely opportunities for students to um, engage with a, a narrow-focused curriculum in a meaningful way. They're largely investigatory, um, and our students um, really enjoy those, and they have the opportunity to choose something that they're passionate about. Those go for the first two trimesters of the year. Um, and while they're taking those, they're also taking a college counseling course. And this is one of the things that we're also very proud of is that, again, when we think about college preparatory, it's not just what the students are doing, but what we're doing for them. And so every student as a requirement for graduation must take a college counseling course. And this is a daily course where they're meeting with a dedicated college guidance counselor, where they're exploring colleges and in you know, I, I always tell, I always like to tell this story where it was, 
you know, when I was in high school, we took the old ASVAB test and I got the results and it was like, you're going to be a priest or like a clown. And I was like, oh, well, I don't want to you know, be either of those things. And it's like, okay, so what do I do now? Um, so, so what we do is we use Naviance, which, which really allows students to assess what are the things that I'm good at? What are the things that I'm passionate about? What it, you know, you know, and, and it helps match me to schools. Um, so that way I have the best shot based on my, my academic resume, my personal interests, the things I'm passionate about to match me to a great school and to get large amounts of financial aid um, and scholarships. And so we really focus on that in a, in, in a dedicated course every single day. And because we, we limit our student to college counselor ratio to about 30 to one, our college counselors truly know their students. It's not just a college counselor that sits in an office somewhere and relies, um, relies on uh, uh, schools to, to kind of for kiddos to come in. Um, these really are, it's a very proactive approach. Um, and then that last third of the year is what we call our senior research project. And our senior research project, project is required to graduate with high honors. And it's a wonderful opportunity that in a self-directed independent project that's based exclusively on the student's interests. And so what we do is students, they, they, they develop a thesis. And then we, we use our contacts within the either the local community or the nationwide or global community. Our students oftentimes go all around the world to conduct these research projects um, to answer the question that they've then asked themselves and asked um, the committee to agree to. Um, and what ends up happening from there is after the culmination of their the culmination of their, um, their research, um, they come back and they present it to their peers and then they graduate much like a PhD dissertation. And it's a wonderful opportunity for our students. Um, it's not just some, we have a lot of kiddos that go to labs and do a lot of independent study within uh, laboratories. We have a lot of our students go to the biodesign buildings at Arizona State. Um, but we also have some students that are really interested in film. We have students that work with filmmakers um, to produce documentaries. We have students that work on political campaigns. It's a tremendous opportunity for students to really become engaged um, in, uh, in things that they're passionate about. One of our students in our school in Flagstaff, tremendous, was very interested in law and worked with the Innocence Project um, and, and presented that project to her peers before she graduated. It was a, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity for that kiddo. Um, here's some uh, uh, examples of the senior research project. I know we're getting, we're about 15 minutes here um, till six o'clock. So I'm going to make good on my promise and make sure that we, um, we get to some questions. And uh, so we're going to go ahead uh, and move forward here. Um, and in this part, we'll go pretty quickly. You know, you, you've come to us. Um, you've probably heard about us, presumably. Um, talk a little bit about, okay, so, so that's that, you know, that's the, that's the recipe. Now, what's what's the reward? What's the outcome here? And so we talk a little bit about our academic performance. And of course, because we're in the great state of Texas, we always want to evaluate ourselves compared to the star. Um, one of the things that you know we pride ourselves on is star is not a focus, but it's a requirement. As a public school in Texas, we are required to take the star. But as you can see, our students perform um, exceptionally well. Um, as I mentioned very early on in the in the conversation, you know, it's not good enough that we're we're holding ourselves accountable to just the kids in Texas or just the kids in the United States. But truly, we want to make sure are we are our students ready to compete on a global level? And so the OECD is an exam that is provided that focuses in the area of math, reading, and science, and it it there's no prep. Um, students are not chosen to take it. It's merely within a specific age range and we give it to our students. And we like to say, and you can see this in the, these results, if basis were a country, we'd be the smartest country in the world. Our kiddos are phenomenal. Um, and it's a truly an assessment of their proficiency in these areas because there's no curriculum. There's no way for our students to prepare for it. It's something that we're really, really proud of for them. Um, as you as you can see here, our students also outperform both the country, all the globe and the US on, on AP exams. But one of the things that you can see here is it's not just like one bar, um, but it also breaks it down into the various disciplines. Our students are not just outperforming their peers across the world 
um, in math or science or humanities, but all of them. And so our students truly are able to explore all passions. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate myself for my children is um, my daughter right now, she's four. She says she wants to be a doctor. Her name is Quinn. And so she says, I'm Dr. Quinn, which we always laugh at because we're old enough, but she doesn't quite get it. Um, so we call her the medicine woman. Um, but um, she wants to be a doctor now. I want her to have that opportunity, but I'm certain in three years, she's going to want to be an artist. And I want her to have that opportunity. And then in three years after that, I'm sure she's going to want to be an engineer. And I want her to have that opportunity. With the basis program, with through this one program, I can say with certainty she has opportunities for all of those things. We've gotten our kiddos into great schools like RISD and also great schools like MIT, Georgia Tech, and then also small liberal arts schools in the Midwest where our kiddos can, can wear tweed and, and read books. It's a tremendous opportunity for, for students and it truly opens their doors. You can see some of the AP Scholar results. Our students largely outperform um, with respect to their academic performance on the advanced placement exams. Um, SATs and ACTs, we can always, we always see that, um, you know, these are metrics by which students uh, access um, at times uh, scholarship money, but most often um, uh, uh, the entrance into to top tier schools. Um, one of the things that we're proud of, though, is 100 um, percent college acceptance rate of our kiddos. Um, and this is just a little bit of a a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of uh, information relative to those kids that have graduated. Um, but this doesn't tell the whole story. This is across the network. The number uh, for our Shabano campus, which is our, flag, our flagship school um, here in Texas, of which I was fortunate enough, that was the merge of our medical center, our, our North Central campus before they became primaries. I was fortunate enough to lead medical center for a number of years, um, wonderful students. Um, that number is, this number in Texas is actually much higher. It's closer to the tune of about $180,000 uh, in merit-based scholarships. Um, and and I, I truly, when I, when I think about what this means, it opens doors. We know, we hear it on the news all the time, the, 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 the incredible burden that the cost of college places on families. And oftentimes families have to make that difficult decision of, you know, do we sell the house? Do we do this? Do we do that? Do we take out enormous amounts of debt? On top of the merit-based scholarships that our students are, are able to access through their academic performance and that, that intense work and knowledgeable work of our college counselors, we also recognize that while we pay for all of our advanced placements exams for our students, every passing score in most instances, depending on the college, they are able to, um, they are able to, um, Colleges accept those for credit. Now, not every instance, and you know, we can get into the nuances, but the vast majority of colleges in the United States take most of those courses um, for credit. And so I always tell the story of, of one of our students, kind of, uh, her, her name is Rena from Flagstaff. I won't give her last name because FERPA. Um, but ultimately, um, this student come from modest, uh, modest, uh, modest home, um, tremendous kiddo, lots of grit. Um, uh, sh this person graduated, went to a school in California, and uh, and uh, they accepted um, enough college courses um, to where she, based on her advanced placement exams, um, to where she actually started mid midway through her sophomore year. And so because she's a true basis student, she actually calculated the cost savings. Um, so between, come, you know, that year and a half shed off the college program, that year of tuition, room and board, books, all that kind of stuff. Um, we, she calculated it out to be about $100,000 in cost savings, and that was before um, the, the merit-based scholarship. So quite literally, she saved hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it came from a modest $1,200 um, investment, at least purely just in the cost of AP exams on our part. Um, but with that, that, with that cost, with that investment on our end, and then you add the blood, sweat, and tears from all the teachers, and then of course Rena owning her education and being a leader and not a spectator in her education, um, she was very well set to take that next step and not be straddled with the, the burden of debt after she graduated. So just a couple of those, um, a couple of those. Um, 
a couple of the universities that um, our kiddos have gotten into. Um, top universities, again, while these are the top ones, these are among the, 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 the 100 uh, top universities, some of the things that we're actually most proud of are of our kiddos going on to UT, Baylor, um, Arizona State Barrett's Honors College. It's where a lot of our students go because that's a lot of times that's where they get the most scholarship money and they get their master's program. Um, they leave that program with a master's degree completely debt free. So it's a really great opportunity. And so while these are great, our students really need to focus on going where where they're where the best program is for them to be. Um, jumping into something that they're passionate about. So with that, I'll go ahead and kind of identify the next steps. Again, within the chat, Laura's going to drop my personal information. I want my personal information, but my work information. Um, so please feel free if you have any questions. I know this is an information session, so there's always going to be a limit to the amount of information that we can share. But ultimately, um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, parent to parent, um, it's going to be a really beautiful campus, not just aesthetically, but we have a lot of veteran basis teachers that have submitted transfer requests to come to our campus. So there's going to be a lot of veteran basis teachers. Um, and I think it's just going to be a really great place to come to work, which ultimately means it's going to be a really great place um, to come and learn. So we hope that you'll join us. Again, my information is, is going to be dropped in the chat, as well as Ken Tyrell. He's our head of operations. If you have questions about your um, registration or you have not yet submitted your registration packet, please make sure that you email that to him. His email is in that chat box. Um, and please make sure that you, you, um, you accept your offer. If it's still out there, go ahead and accept it by tomorrow. Um, and uh, again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and also, I know that you just listened to me for the last uh, 55 minutes, but please join us um, for an in-person info session. And Ken and I are going to be sharing a newsletter this week, and it's going to be kind of kicking off the year. We know it's early. We know it's January, but we are excited to build community. And so we're going to start doing some fun events for the kids and then also the parents to make sure that when we open those doors on day one, that we're not just, a, we're not a new community, but we're a community ready to learn together. And with that, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and open it up to, uh, to Laura if we have any kind of outstanding questions. Perfect. So thanks everyone for all the great questions in the chat box. Um, Ken and I were going through and trying to answer as many as possible. And then I was taking notes of ones that we haven't yet. Um, so I'll run through those now. So first one, David, there were a couple of questions just about transitioning in, um, both from transitioning in from a non-basis campus, as well as transitioning in from a, another basis campus in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about that and how being a new school and bringing those two groups together, what that looks like? It's a really great question. And so the, the, the best thing is at a new school, everybody's new. So you don't have to be the new kid. So it's the best time to come into a school. Um, that being said, it does present some challenges. We recognize that students, depending on what schools they've been to, they may have had great, uh, you know, good opportunity, good access to education. Some may be lacking a little bit. And again, that's not saying anything about the schools around us. We've got great schools um, in San Antonio and great options. We just think we're a pretty darn good one too. Um, and so, but ultimately we provide something very, very different and, and we think we're the best. Um, but we also recognize that with that comes that um, some challenges. And so we actually design our curriculum in a way that spirals as we kind of talked a little bit about. So it makes sure that we're able to, all students are able to access something to keep them intellectually stimulated. Now we recognize that some students may come lacking. And that's really where that two teacher model comes in and that strong progress monitoring to make sure that we're identifying gaps early for our students that may have not had been exposed um, to this level of rigor. Um, to make sure that we're bringing them up to speed and not just in content, but also how to be a student. You know, it's one of the things I didn't really touch on um, in the, the, the part about student support. You know, a lot of times students are struggling, not because they're not able to access the curriculum, but because they're learning how to be students. And so a lot of time it's, it's developing the, the student in addition to making sure that they have access to greater uh, resources with respect to the content. As always with our existing basis students, they'll continue to receive the traditional basis program. Um, but if you're worried about your student not being able to come in 
coming from you know NISD or or otherwise. Um, that's not something that um, you really need to worry about specifically because as we grow, these are all things we've taught through, and we have safety nets at every level to make sure that the students are struggling a little bit. We're there to catch them and, and pick them up, and then the students that are ready to fly, we're ready to help them. Perfect. And then also folks were curious about boss camp. And so we did share what that stands for and that the dates are still being finalized, but particularly kind of for folks who are not familiar with that, what happens during boss camp? And then there are also specific questions around, uh, is that available for kindergartners? Yeah, so it's a great question. So we, because we're a new school, again, we're, we recognize that everybody's going to be new, maybe not new to basis, but certainly new to JLJ. So we're going to be working to develop um, a pro, and we've, it's already been developed, but roll out the basis organizational skills for success program. It's a one to two week program in the summertime that really focuses on developing those skills early in, in getting our students ready to hit the ground running on day one. It's not a requirement for students to take this, but it's a great opportunity for them to meet the kiddos in their grade, in their class that they're going to be there. They're going to get their locker. They're going to get their cubby. They're going to have fun. They're also going to work on things like note-taking skills and organizational strategies. And, all, and at the early, early ages, handwriting, you know, how to, wh where does our pencil pouch go, right? Those, those rudimentary skills that oftentimes um, are a hindrance to success. And then, and again, it's okay if you can't participate because those are ingrained in everything that we do throughout the year. So we encourage families to participate because the building is still under construction. We we, we anticipate it being done early enough to where we can host it at our campus, but we it will happen, the, the boss camp will happen in July um, and more information will come out about that specifically. Perfect. And then also a number of questions about foreign language. Uh, a couple of them that, that came through a few times. One is just about Mandarin. Okay. So speaking more to why Mandarin in the early grades, and then also more about the options that students have once they're at the middle school, high school level. Great. So I'll, I'll do a high level overview of foreign language. And if you didn't get that itch scratch, go ahead and email me or call me and we can go into greater depth. But simply put, um, when we think about um, our students in, in competing at a globally competitive level, we recognize that English is 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 the primary kind of operating language um, in the world economy. Um, French is up there. Um, a lot of folks say, hey, why not Spanish? Um, well, Spanish is, of course, important being in proximity to to a Spanish speaking country. Um, uh, we're you know, and, and of course, I, you know, my minor in college was Spanish. And so I have a great uh, appreciation for it. Um, but it's really only taught, it's only kind of uh, uh, spoken by about 300 million people in the world when we think of, when we kind of break it down in terms of um, predominant languages within countries. Um, when we think about uh, Chinese and Mandarin, um, it's about a billion, right? And so ultimately, when we think about the, kind of the, the growth of the overall world economy, um, what benefits our student and working understanding of the Mandarin language, in addition to some of the research that suggests it's kind of a left brain, right brain thing, so it enhances the learning experience. We thought at the earliest ages, um, we'll teach our students both the written and the, 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 the spoken language of Mandarin. So that goes from grades K until four. Um, then what happens is we recognize that our kiddos um, want to branch off. Maybe they're not that interested in Mandarin. They've got that kind of foundational understanding of the Mandarin uh, language, um, but they want to branch off. Maybe they want to jump into Spanish because um, you know, mom and dad uh, speak Spanish at home and, and or grandma and grandpa, or alternatively, maybe I'm just interested in going studying in abroad in Spain. Um, um, and so we give those opportunities for our students. But over the years, we've recognized that a very small number of our students actually end up at that advanced placement level in language. And so we started thinking, and again, this goes back to the state of the art, we're constantly working and evaluating our own, our own weaknesses and getting better at getting better. We're very proud of our results. But one of the fundamental principles of, of basis ed in the organization as a whole is good is not good enough. And so um, what we what we've done in our middle school grades is we offer um, a, uh, we offer a Latin and linguistics courses to make sure that our students understand what is language, how is it derived and how does it operate, which we hope will have the effect of um, supporting our students and leading to a greater opportunity for students to become proficient 
um, and, and participate in those advanced placement courses. Um, and then starting in eighth grade, our students have the opportunity to choose their languages. Um, the four major languages that our students have the opportunity to choose from are Mandarin, Spanish, uh, French, and Latin. Perfect. And then we had some questions regarding college acceptance when you were talking through that. And so some of the specific questions, uh, one is being accepted to a college a requirement for graduation from a basis school. Um, two is the 100% acceptance rate inclusive of both four years and community colleges. And then three kind of how do we, what are, we, what are our thoughts on SAT um, testing? Do we value that? Good questions. All right. So we'll start at the beginning. So one of the questions, the first question, if I, if I, I, I can repeat them if you want me to, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to do it. I, I got to test my memory. So the first question was related to hundred percent college acceptance. Um, what does that entail? Um, does that include, um, the, I'm sorry, graduation requirement. So it is not a graduation requirement that students um, are accepted, like meaning that if you're not accepted to a four-year school, then you do not get a diploma. That is, it's not a requirement, but as, as a function of the college counseling course, you must, and we support our students in applying to four-year and uh, four-year colleges. So that's why we're able to say all of our students get accepted to all to, to colleges. Um, now that 100% college acceptance rate is overwhelmingly predominantly um, a four-year universities, but in recent years, um, especially here in Arizona, there are student, there are college, uh, community college programs, and I'll use a perfect example um, here in Arizona. Um, one of the best nursing programs in the area is actually at a community college. And so some of our kiddos that want, have that desire to jump into a nursing program and not sit on a wait list at, at Arizona State University opt to jump into to the community college. So while the vast majority of them are four-year universities, that 100% college College acceptance rate is not necessarily inclu solely inclusive of four-year acceptance because in some cases our students opt into specific programs at the community college. And then to that last question, although, but I will say, I will say those kiddos um, do apply. It's a requirement to apply through the college counseling program. And then finally, the SAT and the ACT, do we value those? We value those insofar as they are another um, kind of another notch on the belt. We prepare our students for these exams. We ensure that our students are best prepared for these for these exams because we recognize that um, if you're getting a 20 on an, on an ACT, you can forget about schools like Stanford. It's just not gonna happen. And so we wanna do everything that we can to ensure that our students have the best opportunity to, to and best opportunities to go to their school of choice. Now, um, if the calculus changes, and of course, there's a lot of, of noise out there about um, uh, the college board kind of shaking up the SAT and, and some of in colleges maybe placing less of an emphasis on the, those entrance exams. Um, uh, we recognize that it's a metric of student uh, of, uh, of academic acumen. Um, it's not, you know, it, there's never an instance where a singular data point defines a student or they're defined by their grades or they're defined by their GPA. I actually heard um, somebody had told me one uh, at one point, um, a good friend of mine, she's a college counselor at one of our schools at, in Mesa, um, she was told by her, uh, by one of her professors when she entered college, um, he was very blunt, he said that your GPA is the least interesting, interesting thing about you. And I believe that's my core. Yes, that is, that is a mark of academic achievement. But that's not the most that does not define you. And so in the same way, yes, there's an emphasis on these these entrance exams because they're they provide opportunity for students. Um, that's not who they are. That's not how they're defined. Perfect. Thanks so much, David. So uh, out of respect for everybody's time, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. But I just put in the chat again uh, the website that folks can go to to apply, as well as the contact information for both David as well as Ken. So thanks so much. I'll kick it back to you, David, to close this out. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of Laura, Crystal, Ken, and myself, we want to thank you for giving up an hour and seven minutes of your time on a Thursday afternoon. We know that's very, very difficult, but um, there's still 61 of you. So um, hopefully I said something intriguing. Um, we, If you haven't yet applied, um, we encourage you to apply. If you have questions, um, and you think, I, I just need this answered before I, you know, I hit that submit button, please call me, please email me. Um, 
we were very excited about this campus. We're very excited about what we have to offer and um, be on the lookout for that newsletter. Um, they'll start coming out uh, pretty often. And uh, we hope to see you at one of the events. And then ultimately, we hope to see your kiddos in the fall. And with that, we'll go ahead and end. Have a wonderful evening. Be safe. Um, and we hope to see you soon.